Thank you for having me here today, Tania. I'm delighted to be invited to participate in your fashion culture series. Thank you to Valerie Steele, you of course, and all your team for your generosity. Thank you so much for being here today, Circe, um, and to talk about fashion sensibility, the destigmatization of disability through fashion, dress, and prosthetics. And would you please tell us a little bit more about your interest in these topics? Well, as you know, I'm no more for my research and the research I conducted of Frida Kahlo's wardrobe. This exhibition was exhibited first at the Frida Kahlo Museum, then at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, at the Brooklyn Museum in New York, and now it's being shown at the Young Museum in San Francisco. The exhibition shows Kahlo's construction of identity through ethnicity, disability, her political outlook, and gender politics. So my interest in fashion and disability and prosthetics comes definitely from this exhibition, where I place disability as a central part of the exhibition. In 2004, Carlos water was discovered in the bathroom adjacent to her room in the Blue House. There were 22,000 documents, 6,000 photographs, and around 300 personal objects of the artist. Her wardrobe is mostly composed of traditional Mexican pieces from Oaxaca and beyond. We have um, different ethnic garments from Guatemala and China, as well as a very interesting collection of European and American blouses, jewelry, accessories, shoes, makeup, and an amazing, amazing collection of orthopedic devices. Um, how would disability inform her wardrobe? Well, <clears throat> when I started the research, I was interested in the ethnicity and disability aspects of the wardrobe and how these two are related. I think the disability aspect of her wardrobe is a very, very important part that will inform Carlos' identity. Two events will inform her wardrobe as much as they will inform her art late, late, later on. Um, she had polio at the age of six, and then suffered an almost fatal accident at the age of 18. So as a result of the polio, she was left with a withered and shorter right leg, something that led her to choose long skirt and cover her legs. So if you can see here in this photo, Carlos traces of trauma and her hidden disparity between the right and the left leg are evident through all her shoes. In this photograph by Japanese artist Ishiushu Miyako, we can see this clearly. And we can see how that disparity is marked. She used to wear three to four socks on her thinner calf and also wore shoes with a built-up heel. And as I said previously, long skirts to, to mark this asymmetry. So this shows us how she established a close relationship between her body and her dress from a very early age. Then as we all know, uh, at the age of 18, when Carlo was traveling in, in, in a bus coming back from school, her bus collided with a tramway. And after this accident, she was confined to her bed for almost a year. This was the beginning of the career of a great artist, but also the beginning of the, ter the deterioration of her body. So what happened? So Carlo would cover her disabilities underneath these beautiful ethnic dresses and all these amazing fabrics. As we see in these photographs um, by Nicholas Morai, she would cover her body, but she would uncover it openly through her art. And Tanya, I think something really interesting and why I think, what I think um, talking about Carlos wardrobe today, and not only as an artist, but as a woman, and why I think Carlos' image endures is because she was able to break a lot of taboos about women experience, about the challenges to overcome illness and physical injury, and both exposing them and working through this trauma in creative ways. And I think this resilience and her fighting attitude and determination to enjoy life despite her difficulties and the difficulties she encouraged makes her a powerful symbol. And that's why I think she continues to, to speak to different groups. I think her iconic image really communicates strength and possibility for change. So I wanted to bring all these aspects um, you know, of, of, of Kahlo 
the artist and the woman into this exhibition space. I decided to place disability at the center of this exhibition, you know, to, to, to relent the way we look at these topics. And I wanted to pe uh, people to experience these objects from a, from a more human perspective. So Circe, can you take us through some examples of your installations? Um, sure, sure. This is the, a slide of the, an, an installation shot of the first exhibition that was shown at the Frida Kahlo Museum, which was split into two main themes, Frida's construction of style and the representation of her image in the avant-garde through contemporary fashion. When you arrive in the exhibition, you are confronted with this massive disability wall. The tiles are exactly like the, one, the ones of Frida's bathroom. And this marks the origin of the exhibition, reminding us where these items were discovered, but also the time she spent in hospital. She wanted to be a doctor only to spend time in hospital more as a patient than the doctor. So for this exhibition, I work with exhibition maker and curator Judith Clark and this exhibition derived from our discussions for over three years. And I wanted the exhibition in Mexico, in Mexico to be highly visual because we don't, we don't read um, um, in Mexico like this very long captions. So the exhibition needed to be visually powerful. And I wanted people to arrive at the show and at a glance understand what the exhibition was, was about, what was Frida self-fashioning and as a consequence of both her disability and ethnic roots, roots as a personal manifesto. So um, you explained very well what the um, thinking was behind the exhibition design at the house of Frida Kahlo in Mexico City. Here we have the picture from Graciela Iturbide that you showed earlier um, of her bathroom and items that were discovered there. So we can see the white tiles, we can see the um, hospital like cleanliness that you were making reference to. And then when you go back to the exhibition design, you can see this connection that you were describing earlier in, in, in your explanation. So would you mind doing the same for the display in, in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London? Well, here I'm taking you specifically through the disability installations. So, so you can see how I was uh, working with this collection of prosthetics in the exhibition space and how all these objects were talking to each other. The exhibition shows how Kahlo used her different modes of creativity to inform her construction of identity. So photography talks to orthopedic devices, orthopedic devices to, to painting and painting to wardrobe. So all these elements are connected. And I think this is, this is the magic of this exhibition because I decided to not to have any hierarchies. Dress is as important as painting and painting as important as photography because all these different modes of creativity inform her identity. So now what happened in, in London for this specific installation uh, for the orthopedic devices, as you were saying, um, the installation in Mexico, had more a medical treatment. And we can do this type of insula installation in Mexico because we are very used to death. Uh, it's in our culture. So an, 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 an installation like this in Mexico that was almost voyeuristic um, was, was something that we could do. And I was playing also with the idea of staring and looking. So when we look at disabled bodies, we stare at them. So. I wanted people to really stare at these objects the minute they arrive in, to this exhibition. So in London, I wanted the installation to be softer. I wanted a more human treatment. I wanted people to look at the objects carefully. And this installation had, I would say, a more social lens to disability and more human centric. In all the exhibition, I was planning with, with, with Carlos' paradox of covering up and camouflaging versus displaying and performing. And these ideas are ideas I always discuss with, with Ganit and Cory, who collaborates with me in this, in this exhibition. 
And she's, she's one of the most important cow scholars in, in the US. Um, and she did that constantly through art and dress. So I tried to make those connections and relationships evident through the display and uh, of the objects in the exhibition design as well. So in fashion, we're always concealing and revealing. And as curators, we also have to think what we show and what we don't show. Mm -hmm. And I think what you are pointing at is Carlos incredible ability to use fashion as a powerful tool um, to conceal and, and reveal, as you were saying. Um, so Circe, you have mentioned to me that when you were planning exhibitions, you would always ask yourself the question of how can fashion exhibitions generate new visual languages that can break barriers of visibility and invisibility? traditionally associated with disabled bodies. Um, well, um, more about that. Sure, sure. I mean, this question is based on an article I read by Olga Weinstein in 2012. And I think the, the question is not only associated with, with the disabled body. I mean, in this case is because I'm working with, with disability in the exhibition context, but also with topics of otherness and diversity. And I think this is a very important aspect of, of us as curators, um, for us to challenge the status quo and talk about more diverse issues. I think for us, the exhibition space um, presents an opportunity to communicate different aspects of fashion that can change perceptions of, of of many different things, um, you know, related to, to the diverse body and, and diverse issues because we're dealing with the body. Um, but also I think it's important for us to, to bring more diver di diverse voices, not only diverse topics, but diverse voices. And iconic, uh an iconic moment in fashion was when Alexander McQueen guest edited um, Dazed and Confused in 1998. He put Amy Mullins in the cover. What happened after that? Well, Tanya, when Dazed and Confused fashionable issue was published in 1998, it seemed like there was a really exciting moment in fashion through the emergence of disability as a topic of focus. Alexander McQueen decided to place Amy Mullins on the cover, semi-naked and wearing her amazing cheetah prosthetic legs, making a statement and questioning not only the way we design for different bodies, but also the way we look at the disabled body. And for that specific issue, the disabled models were cast in the traditional way where applicants were asked to send their pictures through an open call. And this generated such an overwhelming response that the editorial team decided to proceed with the issue. And Jefferson Hack, who is the founder of the magazine, described how this story transformed days overnight. They tripled their circulation because everyone was talking about this amazingly creative way of bringing fashion and disability together. And I think 1998 was an interesting year as this is the same year when Jean-Paul Gaultier also created his spring summer collection entitled Homage to Frida Kahlo inspired in her orthopedic corset pieces. Um, but unfortunately, Tanya, nothing much happened after that in fashion. Until recent years, we see more articles in fashion theory addressing fashion and disability and prosthetics. Uh, people like Olga Weinstein and how Hall and Orsaba did um, uh, interesting pieces in, in that area. Uh, among others, more recently, Lucy Jones at Parsons, she's doing something uh, interesting there as well. And of course, the amazing research of Rosemary Garland Thompson and Leonard J. Davis are essential for, for people working in the field of fashion and disability. So things are happening, but I think we can definitely do more. Yeah, and you've mentioned um, a lot of academic research, but um, what about exhibitions? Well, I mean, other, 
other exhibitions have been happening in the, in the disability arena slowly, but there was a really interesting uh, show by Alexandra Palmer called Fashion Follows Form, Designs for Seating at the Royal Ontario Museum. I think that happened in 2014. So this exhibition featured 12 looks of contemporary clothing by um, easy adapt adaptive, adaptive um, clothes. And this, this um, brand was funded by Canadian fashion designer, uh, Easy Camilleri. So um, Easy Adaptive focuses on designs for wheelchair users. Mm -hmm. And I consider this exhibition was one of the most successful exhibition addressing disability in a very clever and evocative manner because Alexandra decided to, to contextualize the, the clothes with six other historical 18th and 19th century garments designed for, for a seated L-shaped frame. Because women in the 18th and, and 19th century used to spend a lot of time sitting. So she brought these amazing seated mannequins and, and which are always a very, very interesting. I was, I was um, trying to, to bring this aspect of, of the seated mannequin because Many people don't, don't even know that, that Kahlo was disabled at different uh, stages of her life, but she also was a, a wheelchair user. And, um, but I only managed to include the seated mannequins in the, in the Victoria and Albert Museum. But I think um, definitely Alexandra Palmer did a, um, a groundbreaking research then for, for that show. Yes, and there was also um, access and ability at the Cooper Hewitt Museum in 2017 and Body Beautiful Diversity on the Catwalk at the um, National Museum of Scotland in 2019, correct? Yes. So again, things are happening and, and, and that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, Rosemary Garland Thompson, stated that the strategies and processes of mainstreaming have been most frequent, uh, the most frequent route for visibility for non-normative bodies. In recent years, the amputated body has gained a lot of visibility. An interesting shift has gone from the use of medicalized prosthetic to the fashionable pros prosthetic. What do you think about that? Oh, definitely, this is, this is the, uh, the case, for example, of people like Amy Mullins or Victoria Modesta, who as Kahlo assimilate their non-normative limbs as an essential part of their identity. In the case of, of, of Kahlo, her body was a canvas and, and her corsets and prosthetic leg became an extension of her, of her body that then extended to her art. On the other hand, we have all the social media platforms that have become spaces for visual representation of the body, you know, in, in the diverse body, different people, models, artists, and bloggers uh, have been using these platforms to self-represent themselves and to, to be regarded in their, in their own terms. So, for example, in this slide, we can see other examples of prosthetics made out of porcelain as the bones of for example, the, the, the bones of older people are more fragile and, and this specific artist is making reference to prosthetics made out of porcelain as a material to, to be ex explored and to symbolize fragility. So I thought that was, that was an interesting um, thing happening. Would you mind um, talking a little bit about um, Kelly Knox's vine arm? Sure. Um, here we see Kelly Knox vine arm and um, this arm containing 26 individual uh, vertebra allows movement in the arm to, to, to be fluid. It is almost like a, like a snake and she can grab objects and things with, with this arm. So it's, this is really, really amazing because she can control this arm by round sensors in, in her shoes. So this piece was created by the Alternative Limb Project based in the UK that was founded by artist Sophie Doliveri, De Oliveira Barrata. Sophie was trained in, in special effects prosthetics 
And after nearly a decade of, of working for medical prosthetics um, providers, then Sophie decided to fund her own alternative limb project, as the name says, in, in back, I think, in 2011. So she was interested in fusing this idea of fantasy and reality through her prosthetics. So in the case of, of this model, Kelly is a, is, a, is a body confidence advocate who was shortlisted as celebrity of the year in, in 2016, I think, for the National Diversity Awards. And she believes that everybody deserves to feel beautiful, happy and worthy in their own skin. So again, I think these are really interesting examples of people designing for disability and, and people who are wearers of all these different accessories and prosthetics um, as, as fashion. Um, and what about other artists working with the language of disability? Um, again, I'm, I'm always, of course, I've been, I've been working so long with, with, with the topic of, of Frida Kahlo that I'm also interested, of course, in, in artists and designers who, like Kahlo, are working with the language of disability and prosthetics to dis disrupt these discourses of, of normalcy. So, so here we have for example, Rebecca Horn, who did our, a really interesting collection of prosthetics. This specifically is called uh, finger gloves and consists of two black prosthetics, each with five thin fingers. And she, she almost uses them as crotches and really is working around this, this idea of the, the difficulty or impediment of moving the body. So if we go to the next slide, Mm -hmm. For example, we have the, the work of Mari Katayama. It's, I think it's also incredibly interesting and incredibly intimate. So Mari Katayama's photographic works feature herself surrounded by things made by her. She was born with a rare a condition that affects her shin bones. And in her case, the hand and her her legs were affected and, and she showed her legs to be amputated when she was nine years old. So in 2016, uh, Mari Katayama visited the island of, of Naoshima where she discovered an all female style banraku. And this banraku is the traditional Japanese puppet theater. So she photographed the, the puppeteer's hand and printed them on fabric and turned them into these wearable soft sculptures that she incorporated to her body. So she created this, this kind of cross between a tentacle creature, octopus, or a clock of in, an invisibility cl a clock, you know, almost where arms and legs are all together. So, so you can hardly see what is what. I, I think that her work is, is, is really avant-garde and fascinating. Yes, exactly. It's very fascinating. Um, what about this? Why did you uh, want to show us this image? So I thought it was, it's, it's also interesting to see, we were talking about the interdisciplinarity of our discipline as, as fashion. Kanduko Dance Company was founded by Denise Dandeker, who was a, a dancer. And she herself, when she was doing a lift, uh, had an accident and, and was paralyzed from the torso down. And she funded this company composed by dancers uh, with different abilities. So this was one of the first dance uh, company addressing this, this issue of, of disability. So I wanted to show another, another aspect of, of kind of like how performing arts and visual arts and fashion are, are establishing these different uh, dialogues through the portrayal of identity or adopting disability as a, as a mean to express in creative ways. Mm -hmm. And I think Tanya, visibility is key to create an open space for diverse conversations in fashion. I think because fashion has the capacity to rignify norms and generate new norms. So at least that's what I try to do through, through the exhibitions I curate. I want to contribute to change the way society perceives not only disability, but other diverse topics uh, that we're dealing um, with. And and I guess showing disability can, can be fashionable, is fashionable. 
and beautiful and powerful. Um, yes, and you're always an advocate for incorporating um, different voices, not only in what's represented in the museum, but also in the organizers of exhibitions themselves. Yeah, I believe collaboration is key for, for the success of, of exhibitions. I don't believe that designers or curators, we can work in isolation. I think um, fashion is a collaborative system and, and, and we work together. We, we need to establish those, those, those dialogues. And as you correctly say, I, I love working with diverse topics, but also with diverse teams. I think those voices uh, are, we, it is important to have, to, to have this, this different diverse teams to have diverse um, conversations. So Circe, you wanted to end this talk with a quote that you think is of great importance. And I'm gonna show it here on screen. Um, the way cultures define, think about and treat those who currently have marked disabilities is how all its future citizens may uh, well be perceived once they're able-bodied become less abled and th than they are now by age, degeneration, or some sudden or gradual change in physical or mental capacities. Yes, exactly. This quote is by Sarah Hendren, um, disability engineer and, re and researcher. And I think her point is really important because um, we are all going to be disabled at some point. And the way we look at disability today, Tania, is the way we're going to look at disability in the future. And, and this made me think because my, my own interest in fashion and disability and prosthetics comes from the exhibition I curated of Kahlo, as, as I previously said, where I place disability as a central part of, of the exhibition, but I'm looking at it from a um, fashion theory perspective, of course. And, and for me, it's again, to try to bring the, the conversations and the dialogues in the exhibition space to a broader audience for, for, for us to open the conversations. Well, so, thank you very much. Yeah. It's been a pleasure having you with us tonight. Thank you so much, Daniel.